Whitney Ramage is an interdisciplinary visual artist, curator, and arts organizer based in Brooklyn, New York, and Rutland, Vermont. She received her MFA in Fine Art from Pratt, you know, Pratt Institute in 2014 and her undergraduate degree in sculpture from Castleton University in 2010. She's invested in various modes of cultural production and is interested in stripping away the hierarchies and hurdles placed before artists by a monolithic art world. To this end, she has invested her energies into initiatives such as the 77 Art Residency in Rutland and Caddisfly Project, a free form art publication based in Brooklyn, New York. Whitney has exhibited her work as, as well as curated shows in New York, Miami, Boston, and elsewhere, as well as participated in artist residencies such as the studios at Mass Mocha, the Carving Studio and Sculpture Center, and NARS Foundation and Virginia Center for the Creative Arts and others. Her work has been featured in Hyperallergic and Sculpture magazines. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Whitney. Hi. <laughs> Forget all of that. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't want any of it, but. <laughs> uh, um, Carol, do you want to make me a co-host so that I can share my screen? Yes. Just grab that right here. Sorry about that hiccup. That's okay. It's such a pleasure to be presenting through Carving Studio. I don't know if, I, I don't think I say this enough, but my very first sculpture class that I ever took is like maybe a 15 year old person was something that Carol lined up for me. Um, and that would have been like 25 years ago now. <laughs> I <know. laughs> Or 20 years ago. I guess I'm not that old, but um, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, a long time ago. I think I'm still disabled from sharing my screen. Yeah, I'm trying to find Caddis Fly. Sorry. I, That's okay. Uh, I'm still, I passed it and then I, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> It's a little harder when there are so many, like we we did rehearse this, but now that there are more participants, it's a little bit more challenging. Yeah, so um, let me just open it up a little bigger. I'm sorry. Um, da, 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 da. Here it is. And... Yay, great. And share screen got Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now I need just a second to kind of uh negotiate um my notes. So give me just a second. Oop. Wait. Mm. Or maybe I just do it without my notes, which is also fine. Everything's different with more people. <laughs> it is funny. I, I thought about talking about our history together, but I just said, you know, this is a different setting, but it is really a pleasure to watch you evolve and grow as an artist. It's, it's very nice. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. <clears throat> um, all right. So here we go. It's, yeah, it really, yeah, I, the Carving Studio has such a, a place in my heart. Um, yeah, it's such a, it's such a pleasure, yeah, to even just have the opportunity pr to present. Okay, can everybody see this? Yes. Everyone can? Yes? Okay. Yes, All right. So I'm going to, I'm not going to start from the beginning. I'm going to start uh, in 2000 and. 12-ish. Uh, I'm going to do that because I'm pretty sure that everything I made before then was dog shit. And um, it's, you know, it, it's all right. Is it okay with everybody if I use colorful language? I'm, I'm, I'm going to. It's not, uh, yeah, hopefully it's all right. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start in 2014 uh, with my graduate school work um, because that is kind of where I started grappling with this uh, 
epistemological or ontological question about uh, what exists and to what extent. Um, it started with a kind of um, skepticism. You know, I was reading a lot of Descartes. I was reading Plato. I was reading Sartre. Um, I was in graduate school. It was a little bit, um, we were encouraged to do things like that. Um, and I was kind of grappling with uh, a phenomenological approach to trying to understand existence. So, you know, kind of feeling around in the dark for what existence was and, uh, you know, making a lot of notes along the way. So I was also at the, at this time kind of um, generating a lot of ephemera um, that uh, I still do. I still do generate quite a lot of ephemera, but the ephemera I don't generally at this point still allow to escape into the world because out of context, it takes on other meanings and that can be a little bit complicated. Um, so about halfway through graduate school, I started doing these kind of touch, body touch projects where um, this one in particular uh, is uh, was a performance piece slash sculpture project where I built a box that contained my body and I uh, covered my body in graphite while inside the box. And the idea is that every mark uh, is an indication of where my body came in contact with this object during this period of the per performance. Um, and so each mark is kind of a record of a touch. Um, and similarly, this box um, is uh, also a record of a touch, but it's a it's called Box with the Marks of Its Own Making. Uh, it's a it's a little homage um, to Robert Morris, and so each mark is a record of every time my fingers touched the box as it was being sewn together. Um, and along similar veins, this is a touch uh, a cube handled once. So I, I made a perfect cube. I handled it once and then I made a cast of it. And then I started thinking about the cube, which is going to show up a lot in my work. Um, I, I started thinking about it as kind of um, a metaphor for the container of our consciousness. I was wondering like what ex to what extent the world exists outside of our consciousness and then how can our um, bodies kind of uh, be either contained within our consciousness and or be the vehicle by which we explore the world. So I made probably, I don't know, two dozen of these. Um, this was a whole series. Um, Grasping Cube is the title of this series, but I'm only going to show you one. And then I graduated to um, a more casting intensive uh, body casting project. Uh, these are sister series. Uh, the one on the left is called Interstice, um, wherein I am capturing the space that exists between two people who are um, a couple. And so the question at hand is like, what, ex what, what is the space that exists between two people as kind of a metaphor um, of the space between two consciousness? Um, so this one on the left is a cast of my friends Ye and Yi Pei, um, and then I was re-articulating that same space um, into a positive. So basically this is what a space like that looks like as an object, and the one on the right is a cast of Jan and Francisca. Um, and then I started putting them in the wall. <laughs> So you might kind of like stumble upon this uh, cavity, which actually is the space between two bodies. And then I started asking questions about my own body um, and how much space my body takes up or like thinking about my body as kind of an allotment of space that I'm allowed to navigate the world in, um, a kind of volume that belongs only to me. Um, and so I had uh, a roommate measure, we, we, <laughs> we did the old uh, <laughs> volume measurement in the bathtub thing. Uh, so it turns out I'm about 1.76 cubic feet of volume. Um, and so that became a new, a, a new questioning about this kind of like volume of space as it navigates the world. Um, 
And so while I was in residence at the studios at Mass Mocha, I uh, had this aluminum version of that volume fabricated. And that was kind of a turning point for me. Um, that residency was incredibly just like life, life altering. Um, uh, and it definitely put me on the path to doing more and more with artist residencies in general. Um, uh, I made this video while I was there. Um, this is actually, uh, probably a lot of you have been to Ma North Adams, Massachusetts, but it's an old mill town. Um, and it's kind of, uh, there, there are all of these waterways uh, that kind of go throughout the city. And this one, uh, it was a very dry summer while I was there. And so the water is very low. And so you could kind of walk through these waterways um, so long as you didn't get caught doing it, I found out. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I started thinking about this. So this video is called Passage. These are video stills, um, of a, uh, a passage, which, uh, you know, I was thinking about bringing this volume of my body through life and, you know, having a start point and an end point to that, um, passage. Um, <laughs> and I also made this funny series, uh, thinking about this volume, kind of like going on adventures. Um, these are, <laughs> these are digital prints. Um, yeah, the adventures of, of this 1.76 cubic feet of person. Um, and I, I'm going to skip through a lot of these videos because we just don't have time to play all the video footage. Uh, but so that I realized at this point that I was, I had been reading like mostly men, mostly white men and mostly dead white men. Um, and so I, I started, I started reading other things and my work got a lot like squishier. Um, I think it came into the 21st century a little bit um, after that residency. I made this piece when I was on residency in Miami which is why I had access to the ocean, whoopsie. Um, but it's called Of Death and Birth, and it kind of follows the cube through this, a, a different passage. Um, I had kind of by happenstance learned that the cube floats, but that's a different, a story for a different day. Um, huh, all right, we had this problem before. Um, during that time, I also produced a series of still images of the same cube floating. Um, and yeah, that was, oh, excuse me. I don't think you can see that. Uh, yeah, that was useful to have kind of a physical object that could exist in gallery spaces, etc. cetera. Um, um, here I'm articulating that same body volume into sand, thinking about, again, the passage of time and, and the impermanence of self um, kind of turned out as a mandala of sorts. It's um, self-portrait by volume. Um, and I started photographing uh, my body next to it for kind of comparison. So I have a series of photographs that um, compare this volume to that volume. Um, and it gets a little bit funerary here, um, articulating the same volume in, in different ways. Um, this was the product of a video uh, where the sand is poured uh, onto a chair. I call this one hourglass. Waterfall. Um, so basically the sand drips out of the the bags and kind of, you can see it, it makes a little puddle on the ground. Uh, resting place. Uh, this is the same volume, believe it or not, um, just measured out in rocks. You know, I went back to the, the bathtub for this, for this measurement. Um, my roommate in Miami was very um, accommodating and let me fill her uh, bathtub with rocks. You know, that's the kind of thing when when you turn out to be an artist, you don't realize how many bizarre activities you're going to undertake and all the people who are going to be dragged along through your bizarre adventures. 
Um, so And so here I'm revisiting that same um, box with the marks of its own making. Um, I wasn't that things resurface in my work over and over again. So um, yeah, I always feel like I can do them a little bit better or they mean something different to me at different times. And so I'm revisiting this kind of container. This one's called the cave, um, kind of a platonic, uh, you know, like a, a reference to Plato and that allegory. So, um, but I'm showing myself inside this cube. Um, and the idea is that every time my body uh, touches the inside of the cube as I'm sewing it together, um, a mark is left as kind of a witness to that touching, a witness to that making, that sort of thing. Can you guys hear me over the video? Mm -hmm. okay. I can like barely hear myself over it. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. So we had that same problem. Yeah, so the, 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 the thing I like about this piece is that it can be exhibited in any of three ways and they're all kind of the same in my mind. There's like a, a, a democratic nature to that, that you can exhibit it either as an enclosed cube with the fingerprints inside of it, as a wall piece uh, disassembled into six pieces or as the video or any combination thereof. So. You know, a lot of my work is like that, where there's like a video component, a sculpture component, and they're like a little bit interchangeable or combinable, recombinable, et cetera. Um, so this was the culminating show uh, of that residency in Miami. Um, I started engaging with like grief and death a little bit more overtly. Um, I lost a friend to gun violence a couple of years beforehand. And so in this work, I um, folded an origami boat for every day since his passing. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that was, at, there are more of these now, um, but every time that I exhibit this work, it gets larger because time passes. Um, this is called A Prayer for Every Day You've Been Gone. Another image of that. <laughs> I apologize for the quality of this video. I could not find the, for the life of me, I could not find the, the full size file. Um, it's in my computer somewhere. Um, I did this video uh, in, well, I was in residence in Virginia um, and you know, I was kind of both like, starting to engage more with like futility and failure and feelings about futility and failure, positive feelings about futility and failure. Um, I've always uh, kind of identified with Sisyphus and uh, yeah, this was, this was uh, me trying to sink that cube, me kind of fighting with myself. Um, <laughs> Again, the things that we do for art that people are just confused by generally, you know, like the, the locals in Virginia were like, what is this girl doing? You know, I, it's like outside of Lynchburg. So not everyone is an artist. Not everyone understands this. Uh, anywho. This one I feel is kind of self-explanatory. It's a little bit of an endurance piece. Again, having to do with kind of like futility and tenuousness, um, that sort of thing. Another one of those works that you're, that, you know, Virginia generally, like, the local people were a little confused.
Um, and when I got back to Brooklyn, I was lucky enough to have this two person show lined up um, with my uh, wonderful friend, Karen. Um, so we did this, this was at uh, Me Too 580 here in Gowanus. And uh, it was just such a delight to put this together with her and to have our videos kind of side by side and the space was awesome. And yeah, that was really fun. And then things got a little um, intense, maybe. Um, I'm gonna play this video through. Uh, this was this was during like a kind of charged time. It was right after like there was some combination of the Me Too movement and then the appointment of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court that brought up a lot from my past, and um, I started kind of like having to grapple with um, my own experience with domestic partner violence. Um, and so I made this work um, with the help of my current partner, who is the opposite of that. Um, and you'll notice his wonderful drum track in the background. And I'm actually gonna play this all the way. Uh, do I have time to play this all the way through? I think I have time to play this all the way through, so I'm gonna do it.
It should also be noted that I owe a big debt of gratitude to both Rich Alcott, who shot all the footage, and also to the Brick Media Arts Fellowship here in Brooklyn, who provided me so much in time and equipment and support to do this video. And I know a lot more about editing video thanks to them. So that was a big deal for me. Anyway, darn it. <laughs> Thanks for watching you guys. And also I should apologize. I am too dyslexic to keep up with the chat and I only just noticed that it was going on. So um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and thank you for your questions. Um, but yeah, the <laughs> we'll, we'll get to them after. Yeah, anyway. So um, yeah. Thank you for watching that video. Um, I appreciate it. It's that's an awkward one because it's like you can't really skip through it. Um, yeah, and it was kind of an important piece. I you know I don't know. I have a lot of feelings about it. Um, and then that work was made in conjunction with this installation, um, which is shown here installed in Rutland, although it was made for a show I did in Brooklyn. Um, uh, this work is called the, By the Long Labor of Tides, which comes from a Pablo Neruda pro poem from um, Odes to Broken Things, uh, or The Ode to Broken Things. Um, and it kind of talks about this wish for um, a kind of reconstruction. Like if we were to throw all of our broken objects into the ocean and have them kind of reconstructed, um, you know, just kind of as a wish. It's a beautiful poem. Anyway, so I made, yeah, this installation is in conjunction with that video. And I have a whole series of these. Um, this series is called uh, A Veil, A Shroud, or A Shield. Um, and it's all uh, chiffon quilts. Um, they kind of are an empty promise for protection. You know, they're a quilt that doesn't protect, it doesn't keep you warm. Um, yeah, they're kind of an empty promise. <laughs> and in my desire to revisit things constantly, um, I also produced uh, this wor work, which is volumes one through six. And they're a series of books that contain, I mean, they're, they're hydrocal cast castings. Um, made into books that contain the volume that I can hold in my hands. So just kind of like thinking about like, what can you hold? How much can you hold on to? Um, they're like little book boxes. Um, I don't know what this video is because I forgot to label it. Oh, <laughs> okay, it's this one. <laughs> um, this is when the pandemic hit <laughs> and I moved back to my hometown uh, and stayed in a cabin up the hill from my mom for like a year and a half, almost two years. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, just feeling the desire to contribute something to like a healing process or like an anxiety about health and you know I'm borrowing kind of imagery from uh personal protect protective equipment um etc let's see yeah you guys get the point and there's Vermont in the background Come on. And returning to futility, <laughs> I made myself uh, a parachute, a chiffon parachute, and here I am uh, in the pandemic trying to fly. Luckily, it's so sparsely populated up, up in Middletown Springs that uh, no one even knew that this was going on, so I didn't embarrass myself at all uh, for this project. Come on. 
Olivia, I'm not pressing pause. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> um, and what, how much time do we have? We have, I think we have enough time. I'm gonna play this one all the way through too. I'm gonna talk over it though. Just a little bit. So I guess what I wanna say about this one is that, you know, so my work is a little bit preoccupied with death and birth and there was just so much death during the summer of 2020 um, and I was feeling it pretty intensely and thinking there were there was just a lot of death um, and uh, my dad said that the saddest song in the world is um, Dido's Lament from Purcell's uh, Dido and Ariana's. Um, and so this is my arrangement of that aria um, and some uh, white flags or they're, they're kites, but they're grounded kites or maybe they're gravestones or some, some combination thereof. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
All right, there's that one. Let me see if I can get past it again. <laughs> All right, <laughs> thank you guys for listening to that whole thing. I'm pretty sure I'm still like kind of on schedule. I have these people captive for another 15 minutes, right, Carol? Yes. <laughs> Um, all right, so uh, during the summer of 2020, uh, Carving Studio is pretty much shut down um, because of the pandemic, but uh, they opened up for residencies for local artists and Carol was nice enough uh, to allow me to work there uh, for a, a few weeks. Um, and during that time I made this work, which is um, called Phalanx Ex Voto. So these are like little votive offerings. They are die formed recycled tin shields. Um, the images are uh, shields that are all, um, or, or the, the, the designs are shields that exist in the collection at the Met um, from different cultures. And I just, you know, it comes from this kind of like, you want to like create a practice where you're wishing for something and like this kind of wish fulfillment fantasy. And I really, when I was in Italy and Mexico, I really loved this Catholic tradition of bringing these votive offerings to a saint and wishing for like, if you, if you put like a picture of your leg, you know, God will heal your leg. I just think that's an amazing, that magical thinking. I just thought it was so potent and wonderful. And so this is my kind of adaptation of that for kind of like a prayer for protection and just kind of like reiterating that over and over again. Um, and so that is what I made while I was in residency at Carving Studio, um, as well as a video, this video, which I don't think I have time to play the whole thing, but I'll play like a little clip. I've already lost what I wanted to say before. There was too long a pause. Enough for my thoughts to erase themselves. I do know I wanted to thank you. You must know I feel grateful. You, a perfect interiority, a life spent venturing further and further inward. You did battle with yourself and won. In the early mornings, before anything really started to exist, before they allowed us our coffee, I would sit alone by the window and think of you. I'd press my belly into the green sofa and try to become one of your paintings. If I made my body very still, the lights go out. If you're curious, it's on the website, so worry not, but I'm gonna move on um because we have five minutes left okay um I also started making this series of cyanotypes as a way of kind of capturing remnants um or imprints of things um imprints of my body imprints of the quilts that I had made um printing things as kind of a a way of creating objects that witnessed other objects um and so I made a bunch of those. I also learned to weave in 2020 because, you know, when you have all the time, you learn new skills. Um, and so these are these are cyanotype printed on just the warp um, before the weaving is made. And what I love about it is it kind of distorts the image and kind of uh, further erodes uh, the that. Thing. I, you know, I got kind of interested in ghosts and remnants and, and things like that. So the one on the left is called Dinner Party. The one on the right, I have no idea. I don't know what that one's about. Moving on or trying to move on. Am I stuck? Okay. Oh, yeah. And then I went to NARS Foundation for their residency program uh, here in Brooklyn uh in the spring of 2021 and i spent the entire time making this gigantic ridiculous life-sized stained stained glass boat uh so that i could make this video it took me like 
two and a half months to make this uh, bow. And everyone told me it wasn't gonna float, but it does. So um, yeah, so now I have this video of this <laughs> bow. Um, thinking about like the tenuous nature of existence and how kind of the acts, this like long string of accidents that brought us into being uh, could just, you know, like the, the, the membrane between existence and non-existence is so fine. Um, and yeah, so that, that's what this, this piece is kind of about. It's called this tenuous body. At least it is until I change my mind. That's the thing about new work is you don't really know if it's gonna change yet, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I'm happy with that title. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll, it's two minutes long. I don't think there's anything else you really need to see here. Nothing to see here. Um, I have one more video and then we're done. Uh, so another delight uh, of being in Vermont for so, so long, uh, an unusually long amount of time, is that I rediscovered my childhood swing set, um, which has been completely absorbed by the landscape. Uh, and so I made this video. I didn't know it was there. It's been there, what, 30 years? Um, and this is what it looks like 30 years later. Uh, I'm doing battle with myself again. You know, there's like this theme that comes up about like doing battle with yourself and like, you know, it, kind of the struggle that is existence and how beautiful that is and how challenging, etc. cetera. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, come on. Right on time. <laughs> uh, so that's all I have to say for myself. Um, yeah, uh, I made a ton more work that doesn't fit in 45 minutes, but this was the, you know, I tried to kind of like put in the important stuff and leave out the rest and uh, yeah, you can find me at these two places. That's my website. I'm trying to do better at Instagram. So if you follow me on Instagram, I'm really trying to do better. <laughs> um, yeah, any, we do questions now? Yes. So. Maybe for my sake, we let's do verbal questions and like, is that in, not in the chat? Yeah, th that usually works out well. Um, I, I was curious, um, watching um, you know, the objects in terms of the numbers of gravestones, kites, yeah. boats, um, imagery that is replicated. Um, do you get, lost in any of that or intentional about it? Or is it just sort of unconscious and you don't know when it's done mm. in terms of the numbers? Yeah, um, that's an excellent question. Um, I feel like some of the things are bounded by um, volume. So like, especially the by volume work is bounded. Um, and a lot of things are also kind of contained within time. I, I do so many like residencies. And so my work life is kind of uh, chopped up into like one, three and six month periods, depending on what I'm up to. So like there are however many shields there are because that's how many I could produce during my time at Carving Studio or like there are that many kites, you, you know, it's kind of like a lot of the time it's just like, how many can I produce? And I often wish there were more. Um, and then the paper boats, those are constantly multiplying because 
or you know accreting because um, time because they they are also bounded by time in a, in a very specific way. Did that? Yeah, no, no, no. That was that was great. I like the time connection with with uh, with numbers. It it helps me understand. You know, it's just. That said, I reserve the right to like revisit anything at any time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so yeah, I I may add to things. Well, I. I don't really have any questions, Whitney, but I really enjoy the fact that you love exploring materials and just went with whatever you had or, or found or thought of to get your ideas across. So that, that's really, inter really great. And thank you for sharing all this. Oh, thank you. No, that's, I love, I love that you appreciate that. I, um, Sometimes it feels really, sometimes I wish I were a painter. Like I have friends who are painters and their projects always start the same way with this beautiful, pristine rectangle. And I feel so envious of that. And I find that I'm constantly like in the pursuit of a new skill where it's like, well, I don't really want to be good at stained glass per se, but I really need to make this giant stained glass boat. So I have to learn how to do it well enough to like get the thing done. And so I find that I'm always, you know, you know, master of none, kind of just learning as fast as I can to produce whatever project I'm working on. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of the, um, the couple of weeks ago when you <laughs> were trying, <laughs> experimenting with the, the glass. I That's know. true. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't include those because they're, yeah, I'm off to, uh, I'm actually off to Wyoming uh, next month for a residency. Um, and uh, Carving Studio was kind enough to allow me to use the kiln for a couple of weeks to try to create these uh, slumped glass casts of my head because of course, um, and uh noviceness definitely got in my way in that in that particular instance but I did walk away with one perfect cast so um one one is one is great <laughs> but I think that emphasizes the way you approach it you know you learn in, in order to get the the project done or explore what you need to explore without necessarily having to master the craft and just keep following it. That's takes courage and curiosity. And also I feel like particularly in my work, I always want it to have that kind of like accidental quality. Like I would feel for me, mastery is not only beside the point, it would kind of, I think, take away from the work itself. Um, because I always want things to be imperfect. I always want things to be kind of by mistake or by accident, um, which is maybe, maybe why there's so much failure showing up, you know, so much, yeah, we had a conversation about failure and how, uh, I think I described it in our conversation as the linchpin of my practice. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's not about failure. Maybe it's about the fact that you, it's about process and yes. thinking, not about a perfect result. Right, exactly. And if it looks like a perfect result, then that seems like a the actual failure to me, I guess, in some ways. And back to my first question, was that a silo you were falling oh, across? It was, it was a silo, good old Virginia silo. Thank you. You're welcome, sorry about that. I, I missed it.
Any other questions for Whitney? You guys are making me sweat. <laughs> I love the um, unexpected sounds that you're using in here. It's it really is it, it, the haunting music of the um, uh, with the kites and the gravestones. I mean, that really was beautiful. And there's this sense that it's ending and then it starts again. And <laughs> I, I really, I saw that repeated in a number of the, the videos and, and I find that really kind of um, perfect for the length of time that you allow us to think it's over and then continue it. it it's kind of like life. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Yeah, I think for me also the videos, it's always important to make the videos feel like you could watch any amount of them and it would be fine. Like for durational work, particularly like mainly these are made for a kind of a gallery setting um, with the assumption that people will kind of come in when they come in and leave when they leave. So, you know, for me, it's always important that like, any amount and any particular portion can kind of stand um, and that it not be important to see the entire durational thing. You know, there are a couple of videos that don't adhere to that principle, but by and large, that's something that feels important. I'm always a little bit self-conscious about like time-based work because it feels like, you know, holding people captive or something. I, I hope that they get looked at kind of like you would a sculpture or a painting where it's like, oh, I, I watch it for as long as I want to. Mm -hmm. Unless someone's giving a talk, in which case you watch it as long as I want you to. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, let's see. Hey, Whitney, I just um, wanted to say that I really love the volume pieces and how you took your volume and just made that into different different objects and shapes and and it just that really was um inspiring and i feel like i'm i'm feeling different being in this room kind of thinking <laughs> about that so i really I just uh, I, I admired how you how you looked at yourself and the world in that way and um you know i love that it's just a creative mind it's just it's it's great to be around that. And uh, so I appreciate yeah. that very much. Thank, Thank you. you. I love to hear that people are like thinking about themselves different. Like that's, yeah. Thank you, Jim. That That is like, makes me feel really good to think about like having had a, you know, having helped people think. You had, you had an impact on me yeah. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, yeah, you know, it, and it comes from all of that questioning comes from this sort of like ontological question about like where, like where do where do I end? Do like do I end at my skin? Do I end at my like the end of my perceptual field? Like where is where is the perimeter around my person? You know that sort of right, thing. Right. Um, also kind of imagining myself as like a hole in the vastness of everything else. Like there's, there's everything and then there's me and it's like a hole in the giant everything else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> and yeah, so, and think... so, go ahead. No, I was just gonna make a joke about rocks. You go ahead, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did have those pieces that were really exploring the spaces that people in contact with, just yeah. what it looked like as a space. And, and that has a much bigger meaning, I think, in terms of, um, yeah, the, the questions that you're asking around yeah. existence. That's very. And I liked, it's fun to kind of like translate that space both like into the positive and the negative and then the positive and negative space as kind of a metaphor for like the space between two people, two humans who share a life together. And then also the thing that they share together, which is also the space between them. So it's like this kind of like, yeah, I don't know if I said that well enough to say what I meant, but it's yeah it's the space between is 
easily interpreted into like this positive and negative. And so there's like a nice metaphor, um, even with the language around that. Yeah, the sand, I thought that really was successful. You know, the, um, <laughs> the sand occupying, the volume of sand occupying a similar, um, you know, just taking a different shape, but having the same amount. Mm -hmm. there, and then interfacing with the uh, furniture or the floor or, I yes. mean, it's, 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 there's a lot you could chase down with with that thinking. Yeah, well, I, you know, it's also like, I try to, I try to make it a little bit funny, you know, <laughs> it's a little bit funny if, you know, sand is trying to sit in a chair, <laughs> so. Or on a bench. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> or a hole, a hole of space on a bench. <laughs> <laughs> Silly stuff. Well, you have to balance it with all of the heavy stuff, you know, it really is some serious uh, contemplation about life. Yeah. yeah, you need levity in there, for sure. You know, yeah, for sure. Well, if there aren't any like other... This... Go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. It, I like this comment in the chat that Stephen, Stephen says um, about that this feels like a search for weightlessness or immateriality, which feels exactly right, you know? Um, yeah, kind of like consciousness is a little bit material. And then there's also questions about, you know, it, existence and what exists and to what extent and, you know, kind of going back to that Cartesian doubt. Um, even though I've kind of accepted that things generally exist and that took me a while, but I, I think I'm there. Really, I think Woody Allen said it best. He said, um, some people don't believe in reality, but it's still the best place to get a good steak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Love a good steak. <laughs> Whitney, I just... Um... I wanted to say thank you so much. And um, I don't really have questions, but I just wanted to let you know that I feel really verklempt um, with the breadth and depth of your interdisciplinary creativity and, and curiosity and it's much appreciated. And recompense was especially meaningful and powerful for me. And I would be remiss to not share how how much that meant and I appreciate you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. That that means a lot to me. That made me shy. <laughs> <laughs> well beyond beyond powerful and and, and all that, it was playful and delightful as well. And I, I appreciate the play as much as the depth. Always try to be playing. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right, well, should we let my dad go to bed? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Whitney. This was really wonderful. And, and I am going to finish up that um, video on your website <laughs> that you had started at the carving studio. Oh, thanks. Yeah. 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 I shot all the footage there, 100%. So. Cool. Um, yeah. All right. Thank, well, you, thank, thank you all for listening. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, everybody.